what is it that makes wealth management so attractive to a PE firm, guys? Yeah. Well, you know, private equity is very eager to get in our space for a variety of reasons. You know, they're, you know, they're, they are in this business for a financial return. I mean, they're investors in our business for a financial return. And so as such, they're evaluating different investment opportunities uh, for certain characteristics. And, and there are things associated with the wealth management industry specifically that frankly are very attractive. And we think that the, um, the increased level of interest in our industry is really born out of the reality that they're kind of waking up to the Alan Darby, Jacqueline Martinez. This is the buyer's boardroom. Learn the most about who you are today and where you want to be after. Welcome back, friends and family. This is Rick with Alaris Acquisitions in the buyer's boardroom. With me, as always, Alan Darby and Jacqueline Martinez, our superstars, our Zen m and masters. Today, we got a sweet show. This is one I've been looking forward to for a long time, and we're going to be focusing specifically on capital sources in the M&A conversation. And of those capital sources, most notably, private equity today as a capital source, and why they're interested in our business to begin with. So our featured guest today is Matt Brinker of Merchant Investments, who go back years with Alan and Jacqueline from United Capital and beyond. And I'm super excited about this, guys. I've actually done a little bit of homework. I don't believe you. Well, I did. I let us hear about this. I watched Wall Street last Perfect. night. Wall Street. Yeah, what exactly. you got though? That was so And it's a real feel-good story, guys. About this company that needs some capital infusion so they could grow and get better. Yeah. And in comes this guy named Gordon, and he's happy to give him that money. And then he destroys the company. So I'm pretty excited, and I actually think maybe I could read this episode on why private equity is so important to the M&A conversation. So I think I'm on the right track, guys, right? Well, your source material is uh, impeccable. You know, where you're getting your info from, I would tell you to pursue that. Fantastic. Hopefully today we're going to maybe sprinkle a little bit of reality into that, but it's, uh, you're uh, you're on a good start there, bud. No, I think Google, well, did Google say I don't tell you to do that? I'm... No, you know me. I take initiative, guys. I took the ball and I ran with it. And like I said, I feel like I'm a bit of an expert at PE right now, but we'll, we'll pack that as this goes further. But guys, before we get anywhere, um, how was your week? I, enough about me. Anything crazy happen? Oh, stuff crazy happens every week. And uh, Jacqueline has an interesting one. Though. Right. And it, well, okay. So we had a deal fall apart, essentially. Um, and typically, you know, you think that that's over the math, the valuation in some way. Um, but it was really over a perception of the seller's character that really unraveled everything. Um, yeah, so really interesting and, and really no coming back from it after something like that happened. So we, um, you know, the seller was trying to get to a certain valuation level. They suggested as part of the deal that um, I guess, let me preface this by saying typically all sellers that we work with, their focus is on, you know, a great outcome for our employees, for our clients and shareholders last, you know, when those two things are true, then everything else should really work out and be fine. In this situation, that was the complete opposite. And we had a seller that was willing to cut the team salaries in half to get to the valuation that they want. Ouch. Yeah. Never feels good, you know, and, and we're suggesting things like, uh, you know, we'll pay them the other half out of our valuation and for a period of time. And, you know, the buyer's like, well, why, what happens then two, three years down the road when you're done with doing that on your own, then we have a bunch of unhappy employees, you know, so it just really went yeah. downhill from there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting. You know, we, uh, podcast or two ago, we talked about the, personality traits, the, you know, like the screens that buyers bring you through before you ever get to the material things like valuation and deal structure and all the rest. And this was one that caught us by surprise, frankly, you know, it was not something that was, uh, uncovered early in the process and to have the seller suggest to the buyer that to inflate EBITDA by artificially reducing compensation to their team thinking they'll, they'll just pick it up, you know, off balance sheet 
um, that was an immense indicator of uh, a lack of character uh, to the buyer. And so everything else looked great in the business. You know, it would have been full steam ahead. But as I've said before, like the number one thing that takes deals off the uh, off the train track, so to speak, is this perception of uh, character or cultural fit and indicating that you're willing to do something like that just to artificially inflate your valuation was a, a showstopper for the buyer. And so just to be clear for our listeners, guys, um, maybe I'm um I'm listening in, I'm on the road and I'm a and I'm an advisor within a larger firm right now and I'm listening to this and I hear that my firm is going to sell. I, what I'm what I'm trying to gather here is it's pretty uncharacteristic for this to go down. So if you're listening to oh, this, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That that was something that hasn't happened in 10 years. Um where it was that blatant of a admission that what we really care about oh my god inflation inflating the value um and we're going to do these things that are you know financial gymnastics in the PL to get there that was uh really a poor showing on behalf of the seller so it's unfortunate but it happens you know we're glad that that got surfaced because you know it is important to us as you know we're deal advocates. We don't represent the buyer or the seller uh, in this process that we run in Alaris. And we want to make sure that both parties have a great outcome. And to have that service um, was was ultimately a good thing, I think. You know, and Definitely. tough that it happened so late in the process, but it was ultimately good because, it, you know, we avoided having a buyer in this scenario be, uh, after the transaction, uh, really surprised by a partner who wasn't, you know, character- characteristically aligned with them. And once again, with any bump in the road, it provides us a very, very nice teaching moment for our listeners. And that's kind of what we do here in the boardroom. Um, well, should we get to it guys? We had a lot to do. Um, so I'm kind of a business development person for those of you who don't know me. Um, but I'm getting, I'm gathering that the private equity world has a lot of business development behind it because we get a lot of phone calls, probably two or three a week from a capital source or a private equity looking to get into our space, mm -hmm. specifically the M&A in, in wealth management. So with all of this activity or this proactive oomph to try to get to where we are, what what is it what is it that makes wealth management so attractive to a PE firm, guys? Yeah. Well, you know, private equity is very eager to get in our space for a variety of reasons. You know, they're, you know, they're, they are in this business for a financial return. I mean, they're investors in our business for a financial return. And so as such, they're evaluating different investment opportunities uh, for certain characteristics. And, and there are things associated with the wealth management industry specifically that frankly are very attractive. And we think that the, um, the increased level of interest in our industry is really born out of the reality that they're kind of waking up to this reality. You know, you think about other industries that they've invested in heavily, like technology, software as a service. Insurance um, distribution. Yeah. Now, I mean, there's a number of them. Um, and so now their, their target is uh, squarely on the back of wealth management. And you ask yourself, why? Why are they so interested in it? Well, wealth management, and I'm speaking specifically to those businesses who are more recurring revenue in, in nature, not, not the commission uh, businesses, but it's a very dependable source of recurring revenue. So you compare you compare that to like a software as a service model, where you have these um, licenses that are uh, generating you know recurring revenue year over year for these technology companies. Well, a financial services firm is that's an RAA, you know, recurring revenue based practice is not really different at all in that regard. And so that that is something that they're very interested in. Um, they're also interested in the scalability of our business. And that's the reality that, you know, as the business, as the enterprise grows, the cost of adding new clients and therefore new revenues it declines over time. So that's what, when they, when they say we want a scalable business, that's essentially what they're looking at is as these larger organizations that have invested millions of dollars in tech in process and people, the, the, the cost of the client or the dollar of revenue coming in the door over time declines. And so that's very uh, attractive to them. Um, there's a natural tailwind in our business called the stock market. 
that tends to drive revenue going forward. So that's something that's very unique to our industry, you know? Um, and so, you know, for these reasons, they're just kind of waking up to wealth management and saying, this is a, this is a sector that we should be deploying significant amounts of capital in, you know? So that, that would be my kind of, and on Jacqueline, if you want to add anything to yeah. that, I mean, that's kind of why they're so I, in, in terms of, uh, coming to our, our space. For sure. It seems, I mean, for long history, um, like back to our United Capital days, so many of our deals were at, you know, 5X, just steady, and that worked, and that was all the market was really commanding. And some attribute that to these businesses being undervalued for a period of time and private equity yeah. really waking up to the value of it and understanding that you know, mar most firms, they have very high retention rates. They're not losing clients, but for, you know, death or, you know, some reason like that. Um, and even in those cases, working to get involved with planning with next gen clients, kids of clients, all of that to really bolster their client retention. And, and now we've seen uh, EBITDA multiples, multiples really skyrocket over the last few years. And, and I would one one point I would add, like the demographics of our industry um, are frankly a bit older. You know, I, I think you know you based on whatever report you read, the average age of a partner is somewhere north of 55, right? So that that speaks to um, an industry who's possibly looking for a monetization of it in a, call it a five to 10 year window of time. And we're gonna talk about this in a moment, but that really aligns with the time horizon of most private equity groups that are looking for, you know, a liquidity event in that, in that type of time frame. So that that's also very important. So that's, all right, so that tracks. It, it still kind of casts a pretty wide net, guys. I mean, we we see a lot of firms in a lot of shapes and sizes, and they they're built differently, they're structured differently, different philosophies. So to say they're interested in the RIA space, I get the recurring revenue, but that's a pretty big net. I mean, is there a specific target that's more attractive than others, or is that sort of there's a couple different answers to that? You mean a target from the PE who they're looking? Yeah, for? yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would say. That typical target that they're looking for is in that the sweet spot of maybe 2 billion to 5 billion of advisory AUM. Um, they have a professional management team running the business, very limited, if any, client responsibilities. Uh, all advisors on the team being employees, you know, a lot of private equity firms. While there's a lot of opportunity and um, profit expansion that can come from bringing on 1099 model firms and converting, you know, buying those up and converting that to employees over time. Um, typically there is an interest in, in, in playing in that space. Um, and really, really just finding that solid base where there's strong back office support that, that they can easily add satellite locations, um, add more advisors to fully leverage the, the back office that's been built up. In that yeah, they, when they call it a, yeah. uh, the private equity groups that have contacted us, and I, I think that's probably indicative of the remainder. They're looking for what they call a platform acquisition, which is exactly as Jacqueline just described. It's it's a firm that they can invest it into. They're not looking to disintermediate the leadership or kind of step into running the company. They're looking for horses to back, and they want to find a firm as she described, you know, two to five billion or so that has really demonstrated the capability of developing op real operations, something uh, unique about their business that they can invest in and potentially attract other advisors to through what they call tuck-in acquisitions. You know, so they're, they're seeking an entry into the market um, by acquiring what they call a platform acquisition of that sort. All right. So I got the visions of like the person behind the big credenza. They got the cigar in their, but so I got this vision, but I, listen, this might be a dumb question, but how are private equity firms even set up? Yeah, that is a dumb Yeah, that question. is. <laughs> how long have you worked here? Yeah, well, okay. So here's the thing you should know. Um, private equity firms are, they're not in, typically investing their own money. You know, they're, they're money managers you know, like, like the sort that we deal in every day in our, in our wealth management industry. Um, they are typically backed by a fund, a fund that's set up, um, that takes capital from ultra high net worth, high net worth investors, you know, um, that want to deploy 
um, you know, money into their, their strategy. And so they're, they're, they're building a, a portfolio of companies or investments and it's all over the board in terms of how many investments they're going to have in any specific fund. Funds typically are at a small size, like a $50 million fund to several billion dollars that they create an investment thesis behind, and they're going to deploy that capital into that investment thesis. So in this specific instance, we're talking about the wealth management industry. These funds, for the reasons we talked about a few minutes ago, have decided this is a good investment thesis, and they launch a fund, um, they raise capital to the fund, and they're going to deploy it. Now, the interesting thing about it is that most of the private equity funds have a limited time horizon for which they are seeking to extrapolate the return based on their thesis. Okay. So typically, typically that time horizon is going to be on a very short end, like three years, probably more like five years to seven years in duration. And so this fund life cycle from the moment they take a dollar and invest it into an enterprise from the moment to the moment that they uh, liquidate that investment is going to be a five to seven year period. It's actually stipulated and mandated by the fund operating their grade rate. So, you know, it's, it's a shorter term time horizon. That's why a lot of the buyers, when they're on their kind of progression um, and, and their life cycle, uh, their source of capital uh, and their ultimate liquidity for shareholders is what we call this private equity recapitalization journey. So they'll typically start out by bootstrapping it. You know, they're using their own capital, perhaps getting some debt capital to finance their acquisitions um, or other other things that they're investing in the business, like technology build-outs, organic growth models, that sort of thing. Um, but then as they get really entrenched in the business of acquiring, they realize, hey, we need a permanent source of capital. So they'll go take a private uh, equity investor as a part of their capital stack that invests in their business. And it could be a minority investment, majority, it could be a full investment, full acquisition rather. It's all over the board, um, but they're taking this ca private equity capital partner who's bringing to them, uh, you know, there, there's a liquidity event of sorts for them, but it's really more about taking that capital and deploying it into whatever growth model or strategy that they've come up with, you know, and then that private equity firm, given its fund mandate of a five to seven month year uh, kind of terminal period is looking to liquidate their investment in that wealth management firm and during that period. So that that RIA, uh, who took the private equity investor today, they would expect that in that five to seven year window, the private equity firm is going to come knocking and say, hey, we're looking to exit. And so they're going to go seek another private equity capital partner called a private equity recapitalization that essentially liquidates that initial private equity sponsor, takes the place of them, and they're off and running again for another five to seven year stretch. So that's sort of the setup that, that's kind of common today. Guys, I have to say, and we're all here to learn, but I have to say five to seven years seems like a not a very long period of time. Like, what kind of impact does that have on the investment decisions? Like, you yeah. seems like you'd be handcuffed here. Well, it, that's a common critique of private equity firms, uh, given their short-term time horizon of their fund, you know, when they're seeking a liquidity event, is that, um, you know, RIAs that are taking private equity capital might be forced uh, or prevented, I should say, from making investments that are more long-term oriented, given the short-term, you know, exit that's being sought by that private equity sponsor, you know, but, you know, you know, Jacqueline, maybe you have some thoughts on this, but um, that's, that's a common critique is that it doesn't necessarily align, a private equity capital source doesn't align to a, uh, a firm who's maybe on a longer time horizon or, or journey. Right. Yeah, yeah I guess. I would push back a little there. I think, I mean, there there could be drawbacks of investing in something. I think it's all in the framing when you're getting ready to go to market again and swap out the private equity group of, you know, we've already invested in this. We're ready to go on it. This isn't going to be an extra expense. And then also when it comes to bringing on prospective sellers, adding on acquisitions, it's very appealing. Going back to the demographics point Alan made, you know, ad advisors, as they think about their glide path to retirement, diversifying partial liquidity through the sale of joining to a strategic acquirer, then um, that, you know, that's invested by a private equity firm. They know then that portion of equity that they, they took out of the total valuation that there will be, there's a sight line on liquidity for that 
as well. And that's important. Okay, when will this be available? There's never really any guarantees, but we know the life cycle of these funds and how they work. And and it's fairly expected in that time no, period that there would be invest. I think that's a great point um, that a lot of smaller RAAs that are looking to transact with a larger RAA, as she said, they're going to take a portion of that in equity, typically of the valuation in equity. And they don't have any issue whatsoever of the thought that, hey, in five to seven years, or if the buyer is, took a private equity investment three years ago, they're halfway through that journey. So it's even shorter, you know, a two to three year time horizon that whatever amount they rolled in equity into that deal, that they're going to be able to liquidate um, as part of the private equity recap that's forthcoming. So, you know, I, I think it's just important, in, and that's something that in, at Alaris, with 60 plus buyers today, all different sorts of buyers with different sources of capital, you know, we can align the seller not only to a buyer who meets a lot of other subjective and objective, you know, requirements, but also who aligns to their capital, you know, whatever their thoughts are regarding the time horizon um, of liquidity events or capital sources, that kind of thing. We, we have plenty of options for them. Sure. Well, so that, that makes a lot of sense. And forgive me guys, and this could just be me getting in my own way or watching way too much television, but there still is a lot of noise about PE firms only be interested in the money and the tape, right? And not caring about the people working in the business. I mean, where's that noise coming from? They come in and replace men for the ghetto. They're going to cigar for Enta. Yeah, that's fun to come out by. Hey, Curtis. Yeah, I, I, you know, look, there's this kind of general narrative or thought out there that private equity is a bunch of bad people just looking to extrapolate a financial return, uh, which they are, but not at the, you know, subjugation of the people involved in the business, you know, they're not looking to destroy lives or, uh, you know, ruin the experience for your clients, you know, as the advisor, uh, they're good people, you know, they're, they're just, their model is like, it's a capital switch, right? And so like, so naturally the only place that they can extrapolate a return is through seeing that investment progress. And as we've talked about in other episodes, there's the number one way that the RA acquisition that they've made delivers that return is in growth, right? So it's it's not in the Gordon Gecko stripping down of the the acquisition target and trying to in artificially and in, in temporarily increase profits by reducing expenses. It's actually by deploying capital into those businesses, helping them make smart investment decisions, helping them grow. That's where the return comes from. So, you know, I, I get the the kind of fear that's floating around out there, but I have yet to see it. Like I've been in this business decade. Right. I've not seen the private equity, you know, privacy or the scenario where they just came in and raped and pillaged. It's not happened. And on my, yeah. I've seen it. Maybe someone else. For sure. No, I, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. Be curious to see if anyone has a story like that, but the, I mean, most of the capital sources, specifically private equity firms, that are you know inbound calls to us. They they don't have a leadership team of direct wealth management experience. No one really has run an RA that now they're working in private equity. We don't hear that a lot, and so they're really relying on these platform acquisitions that they do or investments that they make rather to have that expertise to know how to run the day to day operations. Then the private equity firm's expertise around bigger strategic decisions, building out an acquisition program that's scalable and repeatable, you know, or other initiatives that they want to do, they can bring in those resources, but really the day-to-day -day operations that would be left to the, the existing team um, and, and really looking to, you know, what do we need to add to that team to get to the next level versus taking well, away. And that's where I think, you know, as, as, as firms that are looking to work with private equity uh, you know, sources of capital or join a firm backed by private equity. You know, the thing that you want to ask is like, how accretive is that capital source to either us directly or to the firm that we're looking to join beyond the capital, right? Like, and, and what you find is they're very smart people. You know, they, they're managing billions of dollars for a reason. 
um, and they have good insight into how a firm should think about deploying their capital. They provide them access to resources and connections that probably wouldn't have gotten to on their own. You know, so there's a, there's a strategic element to the private equity that comes along with the capital, and that you know is obviously specific to the different private equity firms directly. But that's something that I think where a private equity firm can be really accretive to a buyer is beyond the money. You know, the money is kind of like table stakes in their world. Now it's like, how can we supercharge your growth, bring uh, smart ideas, resources, connections, things like that, that really accelerate your growth beyond what you could have done on your own. And really oh, yeah. like help position for that next recap, any decisions that could be made right. that will make it more or less attractive. So two questions. Uh, number one, what firms out there selling firms who should be thinking about taking on a PE firm as a partner as their capital source? Uh, my second question is, what does accretive mean? DM chat GPT. <laughs> I, I don't know what that means. <laughs> I'm serious. I don't know what accretive means. Um, we can take that offline. <laughs> no, no, it's good. I'm sorry. The uh, So accretive would mean the, like, that you're increasing enterprise value of the firm. You're increasing that that share value of the firm um, that could be, you know, effectively through EBITDA you know, profit increases over time, but can come through a variety of ways at the top or in the middle of the PNL, um, but really driving that overall, overall enterprise value. Yeah. So um, plus quality plus three. Yeah. The easy way of understanding it. Um, but yeah, who should be thinking about taking on a PE firm? I mean, I yeah. So, and really, I mean, most common private equity deals that we see are that minority transaction. Sometimes they like to stay below the 20% level because it's different client consent provisions that are required client communications that need to go out below that level. But it really can be minority, uh, majority, full, anything. You know, it's really all over the board. Um, the first thing to understand is really like, do I need someone helping me work in the business or just a source of capital, you know, private equity firms generally, like I was saying before, they, you know, don't really have people that have built RAs that have managed them. Those folks are usually not on the team. They're not going to be taking over back office operations for you and that sort of thing. They're a strategic partner. They're participating in the long-term vision of the firm. They're a resource to you from that standpoint. And it's very important, but that's very different from like joining a national acquirer, for example. Yeah. I think that it's like, do you think that your story is unfold and you have operational chops? You have something unique on the client value experience. Do you have something unique on the organic growth front that all you need is capital to kind of turbocharge your growth going forward, you know? versus a firm who says, you know what, um, we've been plugging away at this for a long time and we think there's probably someone else who's figured out a better mousetrap on all those areas. And rather than trying to go do that ourselves, we would rather hitch our wagon to someone else who's already pulled that off. You know, so the, the former would be someone who wants a private equity investor. You know, you, you have a story to be told, you want capital to go fulfill that story. Someone who is like, I'm not, it, because look, there is a real commitment. When you take a private equity sponsor as a capital source, there's an expectation of growth and performance. And so if you're not willing to sign up for that, don't take a private equity cap partner. You know, it's like you would be much better off joining with another firm who's taken private equity and, and, you know, integrate it with their existing operations. You don't have to go beat your head against the wall of growing up, uh, you know, building it all, you know, so that. That to me, like, as Jacqueline said, is like, what is your motivation for the future? Is it you want to go execute and build your story or are you at a point uh, in your life where you're saying, you know what, I think we're better off divesting that to another firm who's, who's built that themselves. That would be my. It almost feels like uh, a free agent in football, depending on where they're on their career and they're making their next team decision. There's one that's right there on the goal line, ready to win a championship. And then there's the other one on a career build or they need somebody to mentor the next player. Like, I feel like it, 
I, I might be, maybe again, I might, I might watch too much television, but that's where my head goes. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, it's not a bad analogy. Not a bad analogy. I think that that kind of fits uh, in the general sense. I think I get, you know, there's this kind of sense of um, giving up control, you know, that I, if I join a firm, like a strategic acquirer, and I'm being asked to do things their way or change how I operate, that there's this loss of autonomy versus if I just take a capital source, you know, I'm still fully in control. Um, and uh, th to an extent, that's that's somewhat true. I mean, as Jacqueline pointed out, a private equity firm is largely not looking to come into your world and start managing your people, your process, how you do things. You know, they're gonna. That's why they're investing in you because they think you're pretty good at it, and they want to back a horse that's going to run. However, that's not control. That's autonomy. Control and autonomy are two different things. In any acquisition, whether it's a full acquisition, a minority, a majority, or a private equity uh, investment. The control issue is a different animal. That is going to be a legal, legally binding agreement where that private equity sponsor, let's say, who's taken a minority investment in you, they're going to have substantial control legally on how you operate your company. You won't be able to issue new shares. You won't be able to obtain debt financing. Uh, there's a whole you know, host of things that they will have, even as a minority position in your business, that they're going to have control over. You know, And so- I, we do want to distinguish between this notion of um, what people express as control. They really mean autonomy, you know, because in in the strategic acquisition, uh, there are a number of buyers who, even though they're, it's a full acquisition, you know, they're making, they're, there's a whole host of points of autonomy that you are still permitted to retain. Uh, whereas some minority private equity backed investments, it's a bit more um, restrictive, let's say. Right. I think also like they have they have more connections. So like they you want them involved when you're raising capital. They have different connections, better terms. They may be raising money for other firms within their network. There's just that that benefit uh, that you as part of being part of their network that you're you're now a part of. And so it, it can be helpful too to have the, them involved when you're, you know, taking on debt or making investments using their their deal team as, you know, like your extended deal team when looking at acquisitions, you know, it's, um, can be yeah. very helpful too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, we're talking about private equity today, um, but we're going to be talking about other sources of capital too and, and how they differ from private equity in, in, in the future, you know, but um, why don't we kind of wrap up and just kind of maybe lay it out for people like, what are the, what are the main points, the, the big differences between private equity firms who are making an investment in the business versus like a strategic investor, one of the national aggregators, even regional aggregators. Um, the first thing that I would say, oh, well, the point of distinct, the distinction I would make is like, what is the uh, control over strategic decisions? You know, the big picture things like, uh, what's our value proposition to clients? Uh, how are we financing ourselves? Who's an owner in the business? You know, where are we going to be geographically? These are when you say strategics versus PE firms, I'm sorry. I want to be, are we talking about? Yeah. Yeah. The, the, so we're going to compare yeah. the two, but like, I, I, th there's really two points. And I think the first is like, um, from a, from a seller's perspective, what control over strategic. Okay. okay. Like you a know, seat at the three. table when those things okay. are being decided. So with, exactly. If you're with a national acquirer, you're probably not in the room for that. There's a management team that's got it doing that. Right. That's right. Yeah. So yeah. Like if you're transacting with a firm who's already in the business, that these are firms that are like likely backed by private equity or some other source of capital, they've got the C suite in place. You know, they've got years of experience, uh, probably deployed millions of dollars into technology and process and practice management and all these things. So when you join a strategic acquirer like that, um, you are largely saying, you know what, we're giving up strategic decision-making. We've met the leadership team. We generally vibe with their worldview and how they, you know, want to do things and we're comfortable letting that rest. Now we're going to be a shareholder during this enterprise, but the day-to-day -day operation of the broad business is going to be rested with that C-suite of the acquirer. Conversely, with a private equity firm, that's gonna stay with you, right? Jacqueline, I mean, they're gonna, 
the, the private equity firm is not stepping into that role of leading the your RIA. They they want you to do it. That's why they're right. Yeah, they're another vote, but you but you also have a you also have voting rights. You're you're there. You're part of that. You're likely driving those decisions and making sure they're on board. Um, That's right. So like yeah. strategic that would be like the thing that I would think about differentiated between a, taking a private equity investor versus a strategic acquirer is strategics. I'm largely divesting the uh, the control decisions, the strategic decisions, the seat of the table type stuff with a private equity firm that's largely staying with me. Mm -hmm. uh, the second uh, point that we would evaluate is what degree of business lift are you looking for? And now business lift comes in a variety of ways, centralizing your back office, bringing practice, practice management initiatives to the table, helping you operate better, bringing additional service lines to the business, maybe bringing new resources and people, uh, organic growth initiatives that they bring to the table. So um, if you are looking for that type of business lift, uh, then the strategic acquirer is likely your best rep, right, Jacqueline? Yeah, absolutely. That's where you're going to find all, all of all of those things. And going back to the point earlier, and on the private equity side, they don't have the answers to those things. They may be they may have connections to different vendors that you could use and that sort of thing. But really, they're not trying to meddle in your your operations. Like they they trust that you know how to run a good business. They're they're merely trying to help enhance what you're already doing find more scale, more efficiency, but, but the core of what you're doing today isn't really going to change from a like back office and right back office management. The day after getting the check from the private equity sponsor, nothing changes really in your world. They're saying, Hey, here's, we believe in you. We're investing in you. We need you to go build. Now they may bring some, some good ideas and connections and things like that to the table, but you're not really going to be getting any improvements in the day in day out operations of your current enterprise by taking a private equity sponsor. That's typically not how it works. So those two points, you know, do you do you want to retain control over the strategic decision making, and are you looking for any business lift? Um, however, we define that. That would point you in the direction of seeking either a strategic strategic acquirer or a private equity sponsor, right? So that that would be that, so. Yeah. Well, I know one way we can enhance what we're doing, to use your words, Jacqueline, um, maybe we should introduce Matt Brinker of Merchant Investments, who actually lives and breathes the air we are describing right now. Uh, Alan, you got a chance to spend some time with your old friend, Matt. Why don't we dig yeah. in and what you guys uncovered to add some validity to what we're talking about today? Well, you know, uh, Jacqueline and I go way back with Matt, or Matty B, as we call him, uh, Matt Brinker. Uh, he is the EVP of United Capital for many, many years. He was there at the starting foundational time period of United all the way through the exit. So we have, uh, he's not only a dear friend, uh, but one of the smartest guys in the industry. He's now leading the uh, wealth management division of Merchant Investment, which is, which is a, I wouldn't necessarily categorize them as a private equity firm, but they're kind of a quasi private equity firm um, who has made investments at over 80 at this point, uh, RIAs around the country doing exactly what we talk about. They're a capital provider. They're a source of strategic knowledge and connection and things like that. So we're huge fans of Merchant and uh, we're really huge fans of Mac. So I'm really excited about this interview. Okay, uh, welcome to the Buyer's Boardroom guest segment. I'm super excited uh, to have uh, a, a friend and a colleague, former colleague of mine, Matt Brinker. How you doing, Matt? Mr. Brown, how are you about it? Doing great, man. Doing great. We're, we're really excited. Uh, Jacqueline, Rick, and I are super excited to have you on this uh, specific episode. We think you're, well, one, we think uh, very highly uh, you're near and dear to our hearts as a former colleague and, and partner with Alaris, and uh, also what I would consider a bona fide expert in many facets of the industry specific to the topic of sources of capital, specifically private equity today. So, um, Thank you. you don't know, Matt and I worked together closely at United Capital. Uh, Matt was the EVP of our corporate development. So he led the M&A acquisition uh, group for United Capital. And I was uh, fortunate to be a part of that team uh, for, for the last seven, seven and a half years before we sold to Goldman Sachs. So yeah, awesome, awesome time working with you and Jacqueline. 
So uh, why don't we just kind of dive right in uh, to today's topic. Uh, first, uh, you are a managing partner at Merchant Investment Management. So well, maybe why don't you introduce yourself and just give us a little bit of what merchants, who they are, what they do, and what role you play in the firm. Sure. So yeah, um, I'm one of the managing partners at uh, at Merchant, and think of Merchant as a an investor uh, in wealth management firms and firms that support the wealth management ecosystem. And you know, our investments tend to be um, minority in in nature. We've done about seventy um, seventy investments. Wow. Uh, for the last um, six years, it represents about 140 billion of um, of, of AUM in, wow. in the ecosystem. It's it's across currently six countries, um, soon to be um, soon to be seven, and you know, we're structured as a um, we're structured as a um, an operating company. Uh, we're, we're not a fund. Uh, which means that the way that we look at investments in this industry is with real long duration. Um, that you know we've got you know capital that is what we sort of think as permanent. I don't really, when people say permanent, I don't really know what that means, but it's a, a real long time, right? So 15 years. So it allows us to invest um, into our firms with a little bit more patience and strategic thinking around how these firms want to mature, grow, acquire, or grow inorganically, um, and the like. So, um, yeah, that's what's been, that's been keeping us really busy. Yeah. Well, great, great segue. So, uh, in our, in our show, this, this episode, we're talking about private equity as a capital source, and we're trying to help people understand, you know, what it is, how they operate, who they're looking for pros and cons, you know, all that sort of stuff. So uh, why don't I just dive right in? So why, can you give me sort of uh, what is private equity? You know, why don't you just start there and take people like I'm a second grader here. What about right. private equity uh, investor? Um, how do they work? How are they set structure? Typical deal firms and things like that. Yeah, so, you know, think of private equity as a, um, it, it was a, a pool of, of money um, that has been uh, aggregated. It makes up ultra net high, that's uh, ultra high net worth individuals, it's pensions, it's insurance companies. And uh, the principles of private equity firms will make uh, you know, direct investments in privately held companies, you know, super, super straightforward, right? So, um, you, know, speak, you know, some of the big headline names, uh, the KKRs of the world, the Apollos uh, are some of the just, you know, more household names. And, um, you, you know, I think it's an incredibly important topic to be talking about as it pertains to private equity and wealth management, because um, you know, I think all of this research is relatively accurate. You know, 60 plus or minus percent of all of the transactions last year um, were either directly or indirectly funded by private equity. Wow. So, okay. yeah, right. So, and when I say indirectly, you know, it's the, um, you know, the roll-up firms that are backed by private equity. And, and as we know, the roll-up firms, the national acquirers, the serial acquirers, whatever nomenclature we want to use, are backed by private equity investors. And so they're, you know, they're, they're representing a huge part of the, the, the industry. Um, and, and then they're also making, you know, uh, large direct investments, uh, into, you know, sizable, um, you know, pretty good example is, you know, taking focus financial private, right? That's, right. that's obviously an example of a, of a private equity action. So, um, uh, yeah, they're they're everywhere and uh, they're everywhere in our industry right now. And uh, you mentioned, I, I, oh. yeah, so well, you mentioned Merchant being um, organized as an operating firm, and you distinguished it from a fund. Yeah, well, is that what a typical private equity firm? Like you said, it's a it's a pool of money, but the structure behind it, what it, how is that? It's typically structured as, you know, in, in simple terms, it's structured as 
uh, a fund with certain expectations and terms to the underlying private equity investors right. that there will be a um, there'll be liquidity events along the way, meaning that the you know making up a fund A might have 30, 50, 75 positions, depends on the type of fund that the private equity firm is is, is designed. And you know, private equity investors' expectations are uh, you know, investing in individual companies that eventually either go public or are are bought. And that's where the liquidity- could be another private equity firm buying them out, but it's uh... sure, yeah, yeah. It, 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 it that liquidity takes on a lot of different um, a lot of different forms, but. For the most part, the private equity investors' expectations are the outsized gains come from the portfolio companies transacting onto themselves, right? Either exiting or whatever it might be, being bought, going public. Um, and private equity investors' expectations are return on capital in timelines that are around five, three to five years. And, and that's been sort of the and that's been the sort of the traditional narrative of of, of private equity. But I, I think what I'm seeing and hearing more of is um, private equity firms creating liquidity in fund A, mm -hmm. but selling portfolios in, selling portfolio positions into fund B. So if they have a they have a, a company that they really like, it's got growth great growth characteristics, is performing well. They like the industry and the big macro trends. Fund B is buying it from Fund A. So the shareholders of Fund A are getting their liquidity, but the private equity firm is still going to participate long term. Exactly. Like, yeah. So there's a new round of investors in Fund B that are going to buy the position um, in the like. So. You're seeing more and more of that, and you're seeing more and more of that within in the independent wealth management space, where uh, it's if these positions are being held, they're just being held in different stages of various funds underlying the underlying private equity companies, which is interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, let me ask you this: uh, so we we have the the typical pie horizon, and that could be altered given as multiple funds that. They kind of purchased the uh, the positions of the previous funds out, but what what would you expect? Like, what are some of the control provisions? So, like, I'm gonna I'm gonna invest. I'm a I'm a wealth management firm, and I'm thinking maybe I want to take on a private equity uh, investor into my business. What can I typically expect? How can it help me? Is it just money, or are they doing anything else besides money? It, 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 hard to generalize, but let's do that for a second. And you know, private equity traditionally is going to take a control position. It's just right. The, it's just the way they like to operate. Now you're you're obviously going to find private equity firms that are willing to be in 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 a, in a minority position, but generally, um, private equity prefers to take a majority position in the business. And I think again, depending on the firm, um, it, it look we you know we we had. Uh, several private equity investors and venture actually uh, with Bessemer at United Capital, right? And uh, you know we found them immensely helpful uh, across the evolution and the growth of the business. And I think all things being relatively equal, when a firm is contemplating taking on a private equity investor, um, price and terms are generally going to be. In the same range, if you've got five five private equity investors pursuing a firm, price and terms are going to be relatively, you know, relatively in the same ranges. And where they're able to differentiate is a bit of a track record in helping their portfolio companies grow, scale, add talent, and the like. And um you know, when you're thinking about taking a lot of private equity investors, and we did the same thing, is that we wanted to go talk to 10, 12 of their portfolio companies that had been, um, that had been, had taken money from these private equity firms. And so we knew what the journey had been like for them right. as a portfolio company. And look, things invariably, you know, 
uh, their investment is really um, a projection on what's going to happen in the future, which is, you know, it's a spreadsheet, plugging in some numbers, finger in the air, and hoping and praying. But, you know, as we all know, things happen, right? Um, global crisis, you know, there's just things all, you know, yeah. not world pandemics, like things happen. And so, you know, how somebody behaves in those clunky times is really important when you're taking on any type of capital partner. Yeah. Because uh, we know invariably um, things never go as planned. And so, uh, you know, that's... Uh, we would, we would vote that they're bringing some strategic, that they're bringing capital, obviously, but but then there is some strategic benefit to working with them, as you mentioned. You know, they've done this before. You know, it's helping us think through complex scenarios. Yeah. You know, you know how do how do we build our business? Absolutely. Best money. Um, you know, what maybe introducing us to talent that can help us grow. Absolutely. There's a whole variety of things. So it's not it's not just the money. Okay. Um. You mentioned control provisions. Um, well, let me just say this first. There's a lot of uh, fear uh, that I, I just see people when they, a lot of, a lot of firms, a lot of people, we talk to them and they, they know that a buyer that, that we may be um, thinking is a good fit for them is backed by private equity. And their immediate reaction is to say, oh, well, 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 I don't want any, I don't want to deal with private equity because it's almost like they, they have horns on their heads and they're, they're just coming in to, to, you know, just crack in a bird slash, yeah, bang just to, for the sake of making a buck. Is that true? I mean, are they actually, no. you said it, they're looking to grow. So that's where the return yeah. comes from. It's not from firing people, uh, jamming product down your client's throats. It's not none of that, correct? I, I Yeah. I, I mean, I think it's, it's always, you know, any type of outside capital, uh, yeah, well, I don't know. I, I don't know where that, I, I think I know where it comes from. I think people have probably read Barbarians at the Gate too many times, seen Wall Street once too many times. Or it's, you know, it's, been, it's been, it's been socialized by Hollywood. And look, there are clearly, there are stories of LBO firms, leveraged buyout firms, and the, you know, that just ran that playbook, you know, I mean, it, it just, yeah, that, ha that has happened. Um, you know, my experience is I haven't seen any of that. I just I don't have it either. And it's just like, I, 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 my only experience would be what I've watched in movies. It looked like that. Uh, the the bad thing. Thing. You, the yeah. Bible's pretty groups that we've interacted with. They're very sincere people for the most part. Yeah. You know, obviously it's an investment. So there's a return allocation. Yeah. They're not doing it through these you yeah. know, ways. It's uh, like just trying to lock arms with people that they believe in. Yeah, help them grow to the best of their ability. So, okay. But yeah, look, but in say breast, you know, they're professional investors. They have rate of return expectations. They have, uh, they will take the board seats and their governance allows them in a controlled position. That's why they take control positions, right? You know, because when things don't go as planned outside of, um, you, you know, sort of the, you know, the, the variables that are impossible to control. Well, Right, um, externalities. Uh, you know, there's a lot of leeway that comes with that. But when you know people aren't, you know, you know like when the leadership isn't operating and executing, they will change your your leadership. Well, that and that's something that you know it's very important. And I've I've I find this to be true even for firms who take a minority. But there's a difference between ownership and control. And uh, you could have a minority position in a business, but have a substantial amount of control, you know, through, uh, corporate governance and, and things like that. So, um, it, that's up there on, on the, the, I don't, we talk about this in the, in the podcast is that when you take a private equity partner, capital partner, there is a return expectation, which means there's a, there's a work and execution expectation that you need to be comfortable with, you know, to go out and perform. It's a really good point. Yeah. And then, yes. Okay. Well, when, let me ask you this. So when, 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 in your opinion, you know, if I'm looking at capital sources and let's just say private equity, maybe versus debt cap, when would be, when should I be thinking about taking private equity versus debt or vice versa? Well, look, I mean, I think the debt at some point 
exhausts itself, mm -hmm. right? I mean, at some point, whether it's measured as a um, a ratio to you know e e EBITDA, at some point you're going to run out of dev capital. You, you, you just are. Is it you know three times, four times, whatever it might be? Uh, there's just at some point there's you're just going to exhaust access to debt capital. So um, yeah, at that point, uh, yep, we're seeing in, in, in several of our our partner firms are taking on capital uh, for growth, and typically growth around uh, continuing their their M and A. Right. Uh, in organic growth uh, objectives. So, you know, look, I think not necessarily bucketing it as in terms of just the, whether it's private equity, whether it's a family office, right? I mean, I just, I would think of it in terms of just uh, at what point in the growth of your business does it start to make sense to take an outside investor mm -hmm. um, is when you need it. It, right when you need it for um, typically uh, acquisitions and the like. So I, you know, those inflection points can be, you know, it could be five billion, it could be twenty billion, it could be a billion. It, it, it doesn't. I don't think it's necessarily constrained to um, your AUM or revenue. I, I think it's a uh, an opportunity set from the evaluation. Well, and, and certainly the more your growth, however you're defining growth, is funded through debt, it it's, makes your business much more sensitive to fluctuations in revenue like the, like the market. So yeah. hey, that, that certainly weighs up there too. Well, why would you, why do you think, you know, I don't, we, we get calls from Brightwood Equity Groups every month who are looking to get into the space. Um, they're looking for the platform acquisition, uh, which is a, you know, a large firm that, you know, it's the five to $10 billion firm with three 40 year old partners who are net new asset growth 20% a year. You know, it's like the unicorn that everyone's looking for. Um, why is it that they're so interested in our space all of a sudden, or maybe not all of a sudden, but seeing things to be growing in a trend. It is growing in a trend, you know, and I think in earnest, it's. I mean, you know, I think in 2005 is really when this sort of really kicked off in, in earnest, going back to uh, Jessica Bilbao's company and SP Focus and Eden Capital were really some of the very early uh, where private equity started to really understand uh, what was happening in the independent wealth management space. Mm. And, you know, look, I think it's very simple. You know, you have this sort of math, you know, major macro friend of um, assets and clients moving to independence. Mm -hmm. okay, so you have 14,000, you know, RIAs, plus or minus, you know, it's a multi trillion dollar industry. Um, you know, you've got the, you know, wirehouse losing that wirehouse channels, you know, losing assets and advisors to the independent channel. Um, uh, and you know, in parallel next to it, you have all of this wealth tech and fintech investment, um, facilitating the growth of the independent space. So, uh, you know, the big macro trends have been just sort of continuing, um, for the last, you know, decade plus in terms yeah. of just growth onto itself. Um, and then some of the more, you know, basic sort of, you know, foundational components are you have recurring revenue, mm -hmm. right? Um, clients generally don't leave. Right. So, right. Right. So Perfect. black attention is super high, Good. um, and you don't have any inventory. Uh, right, right, right. so there's, there's some, yeah. some really interesting, you have high profits, high margins. Um, and I think they, they, they sort of mitigate a lot of their risks by um, being mindful of not investing in overly um, centric lifestyle businesses, overly transactional. And so, you know, on the, you know, so I think, and, and you're seeing these successful exits too, as well, right? Or, 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 which gets yeah, the more that happens, the more yeah. is established. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And you've got, I mean, you, you have the household names 
in private equity um, that have been uh, allocating to you know wealth management. Um, so all of the, well, I say most of the largest independent, non publicly traded independent broker dealers are private equity backed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, KKR, GenStar, uh, and the like. So um, they really understand this space. They understand the retail client. They understand the independent broker dealer platforms. They understand the asset. They're also clearly in the asset management side of the house as well. So they they understand the whole spectrum of the retail client journey. Uh, 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 and it, it, it clearly is an incredible asset class from an investment perspective. So on that note, um, you, the, the prices that we hear thrown about, you know, in terms of multiples, um, have escalated beyond anything I think you and I would have thought maybe 10 years ago, you know, it's, it's like, you know, and where does that, so like we've heard multiples like north of 20, you know, for some of these larger platform acquisitions. Um, do you see that, you know, as a trend continuing, like, where does it, where does it stop? Like, a, a, I, I don't know that answer. Um, you know, and I think, um, but you know, where I, I think people get a little, um, I think the headline numbers are really dangerous in our industry to refer to. And I don't think we spend enough time uh, understanding uh, or unpacking the terms. Yeah. You, you, you know, it'd be, uh, the old adage of you name the price and I'll name the term. Right. Um, I, I think something really important to understand. I think uh, uh, Brooke at RAA Biz did a, a great job of um, unpacking the CI right. transactions. And, and, it, you know, because they're publicly treated, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it, it's public information. And I think that's a really good proxy for when we see these headline numbers mm -hmm. um, and we're not privy to the underlying terms in most private transactions. I think that's a really good proxy for people to sort of have some discipline around of understanding what the terms are in some of these headline numbers to get those um, well, we, we do on a, on, you know, dealing with the smaller acquisitions that, you know, the ones that the PE firms are after, or even the strategic nationals and so forth, you know, they, the, the multiples we get that you're, you know, someone transacts and, you know, they, they go around and tell people they got a Ford PNX multiple, um, you know, and there are $2 million, $3 million EBITDA shop. Uh, what they're failing to discuss is that the, the valuation on the current business was more like an eight, nine. And there was a four or five turn of the multiple tied to a, a growth or an out or some, some, something future that has not occurred yet. But they, they package it as a 14x deal and everyone thinks that should be the market. And it's really piercing the veil of the terms is yeah much or more important than understanding what the multiple is. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Okay. Well, um, so... Final question. And then, you know, I'd love to, if, well, really, I just want to know, where do you see things going today? Do you see this trend continuing? Obviously, we've had a great deal of turmoil the last 12, 18 months or so. Um, how do you see that affect the private equity investors, um, firms that have taken private equity and have deployed it, you know, in relatively uh, high prices? You know, how, what, what's your progress? prognosis for the next if you could have a crystal ball map or project into the future like when you see the average is really what i want to know uh i, I mean you know so there's fourteen thousand. these are numbers are or sort of hard to actually quantify so there's fourteen thousand rias right yeah and the industry reports that there's 300 transactions per year Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, you know, it's like two to 3% of the industry. And, um, and I think that number is inaccurate in terms of the number of firms, but, 
double it. So let's say that there's 600 transactions and maybe 4% of the industry transacts every year. And then you have some 3,000 new registrants or 300 registrants every year, right? That race. So there, there's, there's more no. RAs now when we started this big complete option trend. Yeah. And, and then you have, I think, 80% of RAs are below 500 million of AUM. Right. And then you sort of layer in the age demographic saying that we've been talking about since, you know, 2005, right? Um, it, and so, like I said, you know, from an investor perspective, the big trends are inevitable, uh, inevitably um, continued consolidation, right? And um, that, yeah, and so, you know, I mean, look, in the 1900s, I think there was like 2,000 car manufacturers, right? Today's there's three in the United States. Right. I'm not suggesting that there's going to be three RIAs, but um, you know, I think it's but it's a very good proxy to. I mean, like the, our industry started in the early 1970s. The independence. Just thinking about that is really odd. It's such a immature industry when you really it is. Really, like a mom and pop industry still. It is. You know? It is like it was a mom and pop shop. The um, you know, nineteen early nineteen hundreds with car manufacturers, right. and you know, so are there going to be a hundred national independent RIAs? Yeah, I, I think there will be. You know, I think there's probably fifteen to twenty today that are they're national. Um, you know, they operate under one brand. There's a consistent client experience. The equity is well, you know, diversified across a, a, a broader base of people. And even even looking back in you know from 2010, you could literally name by first name the leaders of the large RIAs in our space. I feel. You can name them by first name, and you would know who we're talking about. That's actually a little bit scary, you know, in terms of these, what they were, were Uber lifestyle businesses, yeah. Uber cults of personality. And you look at the national firms today, it's hard to pinpoint who the actual, or it's easy to identify who the CEO is, but the CEO isn't the front face person of these organizations. When you look at the big, effective, at scale acquirers now, they're actual organizations firms that are growing um, at scale and not tied to, you know, um, you know, magazine covers and, and podium time, which is, right. I think, super, super healthy for the industry. And, and I think we're going to see a continuation of these firms growing at scale uh, and creating real moats around what they're able to do from a client experience perspective, digital offerings, uh, yeah, alternative investments, estate tax planning. Yeah, that gap between the firms that are really delivering on an exceptional client experience and those that aren't. And again, I, I, you know, people have been talking about the demise of the solo entrepreneur for decades. I'm not suggesting that. I think there's going to always, always be sort of this solo entrepreneur to be able to create a lifestyle business and thrive and grow. Um, but that's going to be a choice. Uh, those that really do want to grow and grow at scale uh, are probably going to need to, you know, tether into or onto something. Yeah, I, I just, I mean, you know, we just mentioned it, the, the the amount of sheer development, investment, the talent, the technology that the larger firms are going to be able to wield is going to make it really hard, I think, for the smaller firm to just compete. You can run a lifestyle business, but it'll be highly relational, um, yeah. and it won't be it won't be because of uh, your fantastic technology or your client, your unique client, your experience, or your ability to deliver multi services to a specific client. It'll it'll be because literally they like you. It put that yeah, that's why yeah, yeah, and that's a good thing. I, I think that's that's I think that's a a good thing for those um, firms to be able to deliver that type of experience for clients. I think that's a good thing. Well, awesome. Well, I feel great now. I've like, I, we've got a job for the next 10 years or so, it sounds like. So that should be fun. 
<laughs> well, very good. Well, well, Matt, Matty B, I'm great to have you on. I appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks buddy. Excellent advice. And I have a feeling that you're going to yank that surfboard off the wall behind you and go, go use it here. <laughs> that's a retired board. That's a, that's my wedding gift from my wife. So it's, it's, it's retired to the better days, but, um, I, I appreciate you guys, uh, y'all having me on and as you know, I love what you you all do, and you provide an exceptional um, service to the space. So keep it up. Awesome, awesome. Appreciate it, bud. Yeah, man. Check you later. Clearly, nothing like the movie Wall Street. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I maybe I gotta watch it again, or maybe there's another movie I need to be watching. Um, Go watch it again. <laughs> <laughs> now, Matt, yeah, great, great mentor for many years. We love Matt. Yeah. It was a great interview, a lot of great content, and, you know, terrific. So, as always, this is the mailbag session, boardroom at alarisacquisitions.com. That is boardroom at alarisacquisitions.com. We will take your questions, whether you're a seller, whether you're a buyer, whether you're anything in between um, M&A related, this is the place. And if you're lucky, we'll read one on air in a future episode. We got kind of a packed mailbag today, guys. We've got three. I don't know if we'll have time for all of them, but first question little long. Hi, boardroom. First time writer. Love your show. I have a practice that is approximately 300 million after 10 years. I still want to grow and work for the foreseeable future. It seems like buying other practice makes the most sense for me, but I'm not really sure how to go about my search. Is that something Alaris can help with, or am I too small to be a buyer? Yeah. Um, so, all right. So one, um, Probably too small for Alaris. You know, the, the, I think the smallest buyer in our roster today is is north of a billion. Um, and, and the reason why is if you're seeking to acquire, typically you're going to be acquiring firms that are roughly 20 to 30% your size. You know, so if you're at 300 million, you're going to be targeting 50 to $100 million practices, which is um, a bit beneath kind of the target, uh, the, the realm we play in. So, um, you know, as there's so many of those firms out there, they're typically older firms that are looking to exit, uh, and are in a really short window of period of time. And it's just not really our strong suit. So, um, now how to go about your search. That's a different question. Um, you know, I would do it the way we, uh, look, you can pull lists from reputable data sources. We use data discovery. Um, I mean, it's public information, the SEC website, you can go get information on who uh the owners of RAAs are today but it's a it's really it's a grassroots effort you're going to have to call them email them maybe connect with them on social media and try to establish a rapport with them to where they would be willing to have a conversation with you so it is like hyper competitive hyper hyper competitive um there are now I mean, when we were doing this at United Jacqueline there were maybe what four or five buyers that were of any renown across the country. Right. Easily north of 100 uh, today and, and probably more like 300 if we're counting all the regionals and locals. Um, so it's just, yeah, now, you know, attend trade shows, go to conferences, uh, custodial conferences, go to your local uh, FPA meetings, um, CFP meetings, things like that, that, you know, you can uh, network with and find the people who are looking to maybe transact. Um, now you have to have a value proposition though. What is your value prop? Are you, are you merely a monetization event, a D you know, a de-risking of the asset for the seller, or are you looking for firms that are going to join you? Um, and then if you're in a VAC sort, that's a whole other category of value proposition. You've got to be delivering the goods for the seller. You know, how are you helping them operationally practice management, expansion of services, organic growth, all these things. So, you know, um, it's a big and by the way, for any firm that's looking to be an acquirer, even if you're not um, a candidate to be on our buyer roster, we're perfectly happy to talk with you and kind of give you our opinion on what you need to be thinking about. Uh, because, you know, if you're successful one day, you are going to be a sizable buyer and that's someone we would want to work with. So um, this question reads small to be a buyer. This question reads very similar to a lot of our introductory discovery calls, Alan, where, you know, sometimes people believe that they're a buyer and there's nothing wrong with that because they're still trying to get to know the industry, but you know, then they go down the path where they're they're learning partnership and growth. Because this gentleman says he wants, you know, Dave says he wants to work ten more years and he wants to continue to grow, and he believes that acquisitions is the only way of one way of doing it. So many of our conversations start that way, 
And then they're like, oh, and they learn all the things that we talk about as far as control and autonomy, and they get to have their cake and eat it too. So great, great question. Thanks for writing in, Dave. Question two, boardroom team. This isn't even a question, guys. Um, boardroom team, it might be nice to hear from some seller firms that have utilized your services in future episodes. Enjoying your podcast. Yeah. Not that idea. Yeah, no. That went well, like that, so right? We, yeah. We've started... We've started the buyer boardroom uh, with interviews with different buyers. You know, that's kind of the, the whole purpose of the podcast is to give sellers insights into how buyers think um, about deal making and and uh, interview them so that they can give like their individual story and opinion on how that process works. However, we are incorporating sellers uh, that we've worked with in the past into our podcast series. And in fact, in a very near term upcoming podcast episode, we're going to be interviewing uh, one of the firms that we transacted with, a, I think a couple years ago, um, and talk to them about, hey, like, what was your frame of mind coming into this? Uh, what was your experience like? What was the bump of the night? You know, freak, freak out, out moment. moment. Yeah, that's where everyone has. Uh, and then, and then most importantly, what is life like on the other side? You know, would you? I would like to hear that. Yeah, I, yeah. Like, I'd so, love to hear that. We're going to do a number of those, kind of sprinkled in throughout our buyer conversations. Um, because that's obviously the other half of the equation, right? We want to give them, um, kind of, uh, tell their story, so to speak, because I think you'll, what, what other sellers, potential sellers listening will see is that, Hey, there's a lot of people that have had the same fears, concerns, thoughts that you've had, and this is how they dealt with them. Not that it would totally be applicable to your scenario, but it'll really give them a great sense of comfort. Um, and knowing that other people have dealt with that issue in the past. Okay, I think we got time for one more, guys. Um, hi, Alan and Jacqueline. I'm pretty sure I'm neither a buyer nor a seller that I'm aware of. Uh, that said, I'm I'm learning that there are some basic operational items I could use help with. Can you guys help us with that question mark, question mark, question mark? Yeah, so it's obvious like this person's yeah. in need of operational help. I'd love to hear more about that. I, I would say in, in general, though, we are completely happy to bring um firms through a certain level of our of our process you know prior to meeting any buyers but really to get to know them and you know really solicit it or not sounds like soliciting some feedback here but um we are very transparent about our observations of how their business is running opportunities to get deal ready um at some point down the road and and give that feedback and we package that up to it into a nice consulting offering too so Left yeah, a lot of times that they'll actually get started with us and they're not, they'll tell us, hey, look, we're probably not looking to transact this year. Maybe it's three years, two years, something like that. Or they come through our process and we tell them, hey, you know, you might want to delay this because there are two or three things in your business that if you just adjusted this, tweak this, improve this metric, you'd be way more attractive to a broader audience, audience and then it would have improved your valuation. So, you know, for those firms, uh, either they're not ready or they're ready, but they need some work. Um, that's what she's speaking to. We'll have this, we have a consulting, uh, I would call our deal ready consulting package where we'll work with you. We'll identify the items you need to work on and then we'll schedule kind of like a roadmap glide path to help you address those items over a period of time. Well, that's been the mailbag guys. This has been, um, or again, that email Boardroom at alarisacquisitions.com. Boardroom at alarisacquisitions.com. Please keep the questions, comments, compliments, compliments, compliments. Keep them coming. We love to read them. We will read them on the air. We will put them on our fridge. Um, I That is the time that we have. Is there anything that we want to discuss as far as upcoming podcasts or what what is new on the horizon? Yeah. So, yeah, we actually have a great podcast coming up with Stephanie Bogan, who's going to be talking about practice management and how buyers really view practice management as the kind of the secret sauce of how they're going to drive their return and improve the life of their partners and clients and team members, you know, so that I'm really excited about, uh, Stephanie coming on to join us. Yeah, I'm going to go watch a movie about practice management and I'll give you my thoughts on what I find out. Right. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks, All right. Rick. Everybody that has been the buyer's boardroom with Jacqueline Martinez and Alan Darby. We will see you next week or two weeks with our next episode. Bring your friends. We got plenty of room. We'll see everybody. Bye, guys.